um, today I'm just proposing some reflection and I'd like to invite you to reflect with me about the last 10 years of open educational resources and what it means for us in academia, what it means for formal learners, what it means for informal learners. Okay? Now, just a little bit of housekeeping, as you know, conference hashtag, that's my, that's my personal uh, Twitter username. Uh, I normally make my presentations um, available beforehand in my blog, which is there. Uh, I haven't had the chance to do it this morning yet, because we're having some problems to connect uh, to the internet right now from, from my computer. But as soon as this talk is finished, I'm going to make this, this, this slides available, as well as any other reference that I may make here to reports and books and everything else. I always put the links there so that you can download for further reference if you wish. Uh, nevertheless, this uh, presentation is already in SlideShare, if, if, if you want to search on Google, probably find it. But it will be in the blog uh, just after the presentation, okay? Now, it's interesting that I woke up very early this morning, around 5.30, and I went to check my email and have a final look here at this presentation, and I had, I had an email, uh, uh, a Twitter alert, that I found very interesting. And guess what it was? 5.30 in the morning, as Paul mentioned here <laughs> when he started, Paul Prims was saying, oh, here we are, designing a roadmap for OER. Andrea, you have, a, you have a mention. And I was thinking, YouTube? What? Why YouTube? I was thinking, it's not slide share. I was thinking it would perhaps be uh, sharing the slides of the conference. I was thinking, YouTube, what can it be? And I was curious, and I went there, and I had a look. And there I saw, I saw the workshop that, uh, that I gave here on Tuesday this week, yeah? A nearly two hour video, complete, there, online. And then it made me think, how wonderful this is. So this is, because there, in YouTube, the content is already licensed, it's already available for anyone to use, download, remix, reuse as they wish. And I was thinking, this is the best example of open academic practice open educational practice and open education and open academic practice. So I'm inviting us, you all, and uh, I'm thinking of it as something interesting, an interesting approach to this, to think beyond OER, to think beyond open educational resources as simply putting our content out there, licensed, but redistributing the content, telling others about it. And this has already been said many, many times in this conference. Yeah? It's not about dividing, but it's about multiplying. And I think, in my perception, this is innovation. It's the speed with which we do things nowadays in academia, with which we share knowledge, with which we reuse our knowledge. I'm sure that by this, in five hours or so, people in Brazil will already be accessing this video and will be circulating it in their networks. And this is amazing, this is change. And this is the power of a mind shift. If you, if you change the way we think and decide to open up a little bit more by incorporating new practices into our day-to-day -day academic practice, we can achieve a lot uh, instead of only relying on the institutions to open up the content, rely on the government to come up with new OER initiatives. We can change, above all, our own practice. So this is something we have control over. So thank you, Paul, for that. Really appreciate it. And OK, so moving on. I always talk about the four hours of OER. So again, going back to this point, it's not only about having the content licensed, but it's about what we do with the content that has been licensed. So the four hours, reuse, revise, remix, redistribute. And I, I ask you, how many of you have actually been doing it? I'm sure that most of us, or hopefully all of us in this room, are actually OER advocates. We really want to see it happening. We really want to see it happening here at UNISA. We really want to see it happening at a national level in South Africa, in the African continent, and elsewhere. But how much of it have you actually been doing in your personal academic practice? So this is something interesting to think about. And now, I'm going to move on to some reflection. 
Um, I know UNISA has been engaged in hosting um, uh, the UNESCO discussions to release the OER Paris uh, declaration that has been released uh, in June this year, right? I know you've hosted one of the meetings here. This is fantastic. I also took part in the meeting in, in the Latin American meeting in Rio de Janeiro and then uh, the final meeting in Paris. And I think it's very important that we go back to the importance of this declaration. What does it mean to us and how does it help us to reflect over the past 10 years on how much we have done in terms of open educational resources? So there are many items in the declaration. They are actually summarized because uh, uh, I don't know if you had the chance to have a look at the many versions that there have been. There were many versions and they were really, really long. The declaration released is really a summary of the discussions because it needs to be a straightforward document for recommendation on policy. It's just recommendation. But I decided to take a look uh, at some of the items in the declaration and reflect a little bit on them. And one of the items that I chose is this, encourage research on OER. This is one of the items of the OER Paris Declaration released in, now in June 2012. And it's interesting to think that us as academics, we have a big role to play in there. We've been talking about releasing content, but there is an awful lot that we still don't know. We know a lot about doing OER nowadays after 10 years. But there is still a lot that we don't know. And research is up to us to do. Yeah? So this is something for us to think about. And this is why I decided to go back. I decided to go back to some of my own work and some of my own research. And the research that I did with my colleagues over the past six years that I've been working with Open Educational Resources. When I started in 2006 at the Open University UK with projects such as Open Learn and then ONET and then moving on to other projects, as you know, researchers live off research questions. Yeah? This is our life. We go about finding, trying to find out things. And I decided to have a look at my work and previous presentations, previous papers, and trying to see what sorts of questions you were asking about open educational resources back in 2006, 2007, etc., and how relevant they still are nowadays in trying to reflect on how much we have found out about those questions, how many answers have we got. Of course, there are no right or wrong answers. There is just evidence. When you talk about open educational resources, what we have is contextual evidence. No right, no wrong. So let's have a look at them. When we started, with the Open Land project. I don't know how many of you know it, uh, but it's a project that has been funded by the Hewlett Foundation, one of the first open educational resources projects in the world following MIT's first initiative. And it was an action research project. That's how OER started at the Open University. Let's find out what it means to provide OER and let's find out if there is anyone out there in the world interested in using OER. Let's find out who our, our audience is going to be and what they are going to do with the content. And it was extremely interesting and challenging for us because we had absolutely no idea of what would happen. We just knew we had to release content in an, in an interesting format, in a platform, and then find out what happens. I think it's a very interesting position for an institution to take as well because that's how you innovate. Right? You have to be willing to step forward, to step into the unknown, so that you can create innovation. But these are the questions. We were thinking, are we are being used by teachers back in 2007? We were thinking of informal learners, we were thinking beyond the cohort of our own students for offering OER, but we were thinking of everybody else that could benefit from it. So here I ask, who is the audience for OER? And that's where we, find, we found out that our audience uh, was really interesting because it was not only our own students, but also people in prison, people with disabilities. It's very important to think of them. We do not talk always about them. But people with disabilities, mothers that could not uh, go to work because they were raising young children, 
um, retired people. So we had a range of informal learners. Now, how can we understand and support the user-provider user cycle? I'm going to show you something related to that later on. How can technology support OER provision? Then, in terms of reuse, we were asking, what are the barriers to reuse? Because OER is not only about releasing open content, it's about using content, sharing content. But what are the barriers? Now, how much do you know about it? Well, we know some answers to those questions. But these are recurrent issues. These are questions that we still need to investigate further. We still need more evidence. And this is because the more evidence we have, the more examples we have, the better these examples can guide our practices. So, if we find out that the type of content we release is difficult to be reused because we release them in formats that are not conducive to repurposing, we should perhaps change the formats in which we release content. And I'll give you an example, a very simple example. You may have um, the wonderful um, attitude of wanting to share a paper of yours, let's say a book chapter of yours, licensed over Creative Commons. And you wouldn't mind if someone used your content and remixed it. But you release it in PDF format, which is a very closed format. Right? Now, if you help people to reuse your content, why not release it in Word? We, it's very difficult to think, to think that way, to open up enough to allow redistribution and reuse. Yeah? So this is one of the things for us to think about. Now, how do OER change traditional teaching and learning practices? And what evidence do we have for OER reuse? We have some evidence for OER reuse and we have some evidence that I'm going to show you for OER tradition, for change in the way we teach. And this is perhaps one of the main benefits because when we offer OER, what we are actually doing is providing a, a shopping window for the institution. People can see what the institution offers, but the teacher can also look into other practices. We can look into the practices of others and perhaps, pedagogically speaking, for the practitioner, this is one of the best and one of the most interesting uh, benefits of being able to look into what the other people do and to be able to show what you have to do because then you can also have some reflexive practice. Yeah, you can see what to do and you can see what others do and change your own practice. And we do have evidence for that. But we still need more evidence. Now, in terms of production, we didn't know how to transform content. And I think this is something we still ask. Sometimes institutions say, well, we have um, a number of courses that we would like to uh, make available online, but we are not sure how to do it. Shall we just uh, um, transfer them from the paper format to the online format? Shall we transfer them straight uh, in the way we teach them to our students online as an open educational resource? Or do we need to think of a pedagogy for OER? Do we need to think of an open type of pedagogy depending on our, our audience? Do we have to embed a didactic way of teaching into that material to help informal learners who won't have a teacher next to them to learn from that content? So there are lots of questions still and lots of things to try out. What sorts of tools do we need? What tools can help us reuse OER? Can we bring content from the world? We know we can, and perhaps this is one of the best things that we can do, is to have content from all over the world and to use content from all, from all over the world. In terms of learning, this is perhaps one of the most challenging questions for us to find out. And this is, do we have users? And if so, what do they do with the content? How do you find out what people do with the content that you make available? Licensed. Of course, you can have some analytics behind your website that can tell you how many downloads you've had, how many hits. Fantastic, you have numbers. But what else can you know about it? How do you find out? Someone goes there, prints your chapter, takes it away. They read it in the train, they take it to their classroom, they reuse it. How do you find the evidence? 
and we were battling with it for a long time and we had to develop strategies to try and, and uh, send questionnaires to learners, interview learners who would be willing to tell us what they were doing with the content, but we had to go after them and try to find out. But the more we know about it, the more it can guide our practices. So there is still an awful lot to do with that only question, what do they do with the content? Now, can anyone learn anything? Learning is something else. Information is something, learning is something else. Can anyone learn from open educational resources, really? This is something you are trying to find out. And finally, in 2012, recurrent questions, because these questions have always been there, but they repeat themselves here in 2012. How can we help institutions to develop OER? Sustainable OER initiatives, not initiatives that are okay and when they have funding, but when the funding finishes, then the, the initiative stops. We have examples like that. We need to think of sustainability. What are the possible business models? Something that has already been discussed here. What are the business models for publishers? We've been investigating those things that are publishing houses just now trying new things in terms of, uh, of publishing OER. Lots of examples out there. Not only research, yeah, but also books, textbooks. And how to embed OER production and use into an existing academic system. This is another challenge. So this is just, just a brief scenario of the questions that have always been there and they'll probably still be around for quite a while. And now, talking about research, bringing it to an African context, I don't know how many of you know of this report, OER Readiness in Africa. Uh, it has been written by a colleague of mine, Pauline, at the Open University. It was research done as part of her PhD uh, uh, work. Uh, but a very interesting report that I invite everyone to have a look at. And she, she looked at readiness for the open mindset, academically speaking. Is Africa ready for open educational resources? And when you read her resource, uh, her report, you, you see very interesting. She analyzed Uganda, Kenya and South Africa. And what she found out, she analyzed the readiness for, uh, for, of Africa for OER in terms of uh, uh, technology and in terms of willingness to use and awareness. And she found out that in Kenya and Uganda, yes, they do have an infrastructural problem. They have, perhaps they, they, are, they do not have access to as much technology as South Africa. But in South Africa, technology and internet connectivity does not seem to be a problem. So that shouldn't be a problem, at least in the universities. However, the main problem, particularly in South Africa, was the attitude. It was a human-related factor. People were not open enough to embed open educational resources into their practices. One of the main reasons is that they didn't quite understand that by licensing content, they are not losing the authorship of the material. They still keep the right, and they still will be cited as the main author of the content that they are releasing, but they are just telling people that they can share, redistribute and rework. So it was a problem of attitude. So again, a matter of practice, and that's where we need to innovate. <coughs> Something else. Uh, that I would like to uh, discuss from the Paris Declaration is the recommendation to foster awareness and use of open educational resource. So again, it's been 10 years and we're still raising awareness about OER and we'll probably be raising awareness for a long time still because it's not only in Africa, also in South America Last week we were running um, a focus group with, um, with uh, nearly all countries in Latin America. I think we had about, I don't know, we had about 70, 70 participants in the first focus group and 68 in the second one. And you're asking questions. Why do, do you not use open educational resources? Why does your institution is still 
thinking about it and they said, well, you know, people do not know exactly what it means. They think that uh, anything that is available on the web, publicly available, is OER. So there is a lack of understanding and they do not know what to do with the materials, what to do with that. And this is South America, yeah? The same repeats here in Africa, I'm just comparing. Pauline's report in 2010, our folks group only last week in Latin America, 2012, recurrent issues. They'll probably still be there for a while. But here's an example of an action that, that is in place that I thought would be interesting to share with you, an example coming from Latin America. I know you have examples from Africa, as for example, OER Africa in the work of SAID, but I just thought I would show you an example from Latin America. The Oportunidad project is a project co-financed by the European Commission. Uh, it started this year, it's a three-year project, it's going to go up until 2014, uh, and it counts with 12 main partners, eight in Latin America and four in Europe. So it's very interesting because it's a cross-border transnational project to start with. And the Oportunidad project uh, has the aim to raise awareness of open educational resources, so it's in line with the Paris Declaration, even before the Declaration was released, yes? But also to work towards capacity building, because this is something else that the, the Declaration talks about, and something that we notice we need to work more on. How can we uh, um, help teachers to use open educational resources and, and multiply that type of practice in their day-to-day uh, -day activities. Um, so in Europe we have countries such as um, we have the United Kingdom, Italy, Spain, Portugal as our partners. And in South America we have all sorts of countries, Ma uh, Latin America, sorry, Ecuador, um, Uruguay, Brazil, Chile, eight, uh, eight countries in total. And our actions are mostly four. The first one is that we are um, launching a compendium of practices. I'm going to show you in a minute. This compendium of best practices aims to fill in a gap, which is the gap of the example. In our focus group, most teachers said, we need examples, we need to see what people around the world are doing with open educational resources. So it can give us ideas you know, and we can see it in practice and see how it could apply to our own context. So we need examples. And we decided to create this compendium of practices, uh, which brings case studies uh, from different countries in Europe and in South America to showcase how OER can be used differently, the sorts of technologies that can be applied for everyone. Uh, the second action is to develop a, an agenda for OER in Latin America. Because we're thinking bigger, it's about strategy. You know, what can we do actually to create a coherent strategy in the region that would really enable us to allow and share content and create what we call a common higher education area, even if it's an informal common higher education area, but it's a step forward. We are really talking about exchange of resources regionally in Latin America. So let's create an agenda. How do we want to go about it? What do we need to do? And let's agree together on this agenda for Latin America. So this is what we have been doing and this is why we have been having focus groups online. And then finally, uh, we have the roadmap for institutions. Then our third action is to help each institution, each institution um, for the Oportunidad project holds a hub of other institutions. So for example, in Brazil, we are the main partner. We have another 10 institutions collaborating with us, creating a hub of institutions. And from there, we aim to multiply these practices. So let's help each one of them to create a roadmap for implementation together, sharing experiences, always on the base of sharing. Uh, and after that, we are going to offer a, a course, an 80-hour course based online for, for all the teachers of all the 60 institutions that are collaborating in total with the 12 main partners so that we can uh, 
work on capacity building and we will also make this course available online for any other institution which wants to then transform and reuse it. So this is just an example, an example of OER awareness raising. It's a massive project if you think in the amount of people, the number of people that have, have actually been working on it um, and involving 60 institutions as a whole in Latin America. It's proving great work, but it's paying off so far. So this is the, this is the uh, publication that I was talking about. It's not released yet. Um, in fact, we're still finalizing um, the revision of the languages. But talking again about innovation, or something that we have already incorporated in our practices first, to release everything, obviously, with, a, with an open license but also trying to make it multilingual so that it can really allow people to share knowledge instead of having language as a barrier or always counting on the community to translate. We always try to draw, to draw, uh, draw on our own capacity inside uh, of the team to, and translate things. Um, and also to release in a variety of formats, ebook, um, ODT, PDF, Word, all sorts of things that you can download in formats. So this is going to be launched very soon and we are working on it at the moment. Okay, and then, um, he's still talking about OER use and awareness. I'm going to go very quickly on this now. Uh, but this is a Mexican initiative called TEMOA. It's a portal for open educational resources and I think it would be an interesting example of practices else, elsewhere. Um, they have content there from other institutions. So this is an interesting model to think about. Uh, this, this initiative comes from the Tecnológico de Monterrey in Mexico, but the content they make available comes from the world. Anyone can suggest content to them. So they source the content from other websites, from other institutions, and they offer what they have the best which is the technology. They are very good at technology. And so they make uh, uh, available a platform that can allow the four R's that we were talking about in the beginning, redistribution, reuse, revise, etc. So this is, this is perhaps one of uh, the most inter interesting uh, platforms that we have at the moment um, in Latin America, right? A different model, however, comes from the UK. This, these are just examples, as I'm saying, some of them are uh, in this report that you're launching. But just for you to think about different practices and ways to innovate. Leeds Metropolitan, uh, an institution in the UK, decided to create an institutional repository very different from the one in Mexico because they offer content that has been created inside of their institution, only institutional content. They don't go outside the institution to look for content. And they have decided to separate research content from open courseware. Open courseware meaning really just courses that you can take. They offer content in a variety of formats, video, audio, podcast, text, etc. But this is a completely different model in which they use a commercial platform uh, to support the initiative and they do not accept external content. So it's, it's not a, plat a platform for redistribution and remixing. If you go there, you have access to the content, you take it, you remix it outside the platform, and if you have to redistribute it, you do it elsewhere. Okay? And that's why I said it's very difficult to know what people do with the content once they take the content out from somewhere. But this is interesting. This is Leeds Match Contribution. UTPL, an institution from Ecuador, also offering open courseware, but in this case with certification, with tutoring, mm -hmm. they have different models. This is one of their models, yeah? certification, etc. A completely different model. So I'm just showing this very briefly so that we can think of different models and ways to innovate, but all of them based on new academic practices and open educational practices, what we call OEP. The next, something else, reinforce the development of strategies and policies in OER. We haven't talked much about policies here, we've touched on this matter. But this is very important because it goes beyond the institutional responsibility to think about OER 
and, and takes it to a more governmental level. And what can we do if we are not politicians? Can we do anything about policy? How? How can we help? Um, and in Brazil, we've had interesting experiences and we are making things change in terms of policy. And I could even perhaps suggest that in terms of policy, Brazil is one of the most advanced countries in relation to open educational resources. Yeah? Why? We've been working together as a group in a, num in a number of ways. Using our contacts, sharing things online, going to meetings, participating in the community. One of the things that we did, UNESCO asked for a report in order to understand what's happening in terms of open educational resources provision outside the English-speaking world. What else is out there? So they've asked a report for Russia, for China, and one for Brazil. And we found out that we, we already had a number of initiatives in Portuguese, supported by the government, but which were not licensed. So we couldn't consider them open educational resources. So it was a matter of working with the government to show the importance of opening uh, the platforms, making them open licensed, so that we can say, okay, now we have something in which to work with. This report has been written in terms of the uh, educational, National Educational Plan, which is a bill that is being voted right now, in which it's proposed 20 goals for education in Brazil, out of which seven are discussed here, uh, and, um, and we are trying to say how open educational resources could help us achieve the national education goals. So this is interesting, this is something to think about. And what I can say is that since this report has been launched in collaboration with the work of other OER communities in Brazil, we have managed to include OER in the National Education Plan Bill. So now it's there. It wasn't there and it is there now, so they are taking it into account. Um, so, it's just to show that most OER initiatives in Brazil are based on the South. Brazil is a huge country, just as much as Africa is huge, yeah, if you think of... Uh, and, and, you know, so we, we, our aim is to work with institutions towards the North, uh, because we don't seem to have any OER initiatives in the Amazon region, in the regions that could really benefit from it. And to think of open educational resources in a systemic way, how can it actually help education at all levels, basic education and higher education? Because we can provide OER for basic education purposes and for higher education purposes and for informal learning and for each one of them we can apply different strategies and we can think of OER in different ways, having different goals. But nevertheless, it's education, isn't it? So a systemic view of education is something really important to have in mind. Okay, another example of practice is this book. It's a book created by the community on open educational resources. And if you go online right now, you'll be able to download this book. You'll be able to choose the chapter you want to read and download. And in the very front page, of this book, it's in Portuguese, obviously, as you can see, it says, remix this book. This is the very front page. It's a changing attitude, isn't it? No? Have you ever seen any publisher saying remix this book? So this is different. And again, this, this is what I'm saying. It's how we, it's what we do with the possibility of opening up content, right? So we say remix it. So you can download it, you can choose the chapter, you can download the whole book. Um, you can read it in English and you can read it in Portuguese. Can you see? Download English, descargar espanol. Accessibility, multilingualism. This is something we're trying to do as well. Okay, something else from the Paris Declaration. Support capacity building for the sustainable development of quality learning materials. And these for me, is one of the core issues of open educational resources. How we exchange educational practices, how we look into other pedagogical practices. The greatest benefit of all for teachers, mostly, and for learners. 
And I want to show you an experience that I had. These photos were taken by me in 2010, when I had an incredible experience in Zambia. I was participating in the eLearning Africa conference. And I had decided that I wanted to see how a school in the outskirts of Lusaka were using open educational resources. As a researcher, I wanted to go there and see. I, I needed evidence for my research. I want to see what's happening. So I managed to get there. It's very far away and unfortunately a place that lacks infrastructure of all sorts. But what they had was a, a small UK grant um, from a project which gave them a number of netbooks, perhaps 10 or 12 netbooks, and they had some internet connectivity and they, the teachers there were doing wonders with 12 netbooks and internet connectivity in terms of accessing content from TESA, open educational resources from all sorts, in collaboration with this UK project. So they knew what open educational resources were and they were implementing it in their day-to-day -day practice and it was absolutely fantastic to see that the school didn't have books, the students only had a notebook and, and pencil, but they had access to open educational resources and they were doing fantastic work. And they were working with, with a very innovative uh, uh, pedagogy in terms of OER, which was inquiry-based learning. I don't know how many of you uh, are familiar with it, but it's a type of, of technique in which you ask questions, ask the learner questions, and they go after the answers, and they learn by researching the answers, by trying to find out, so inquiry-based learning. And they were using that. Uh, this teacher here, is the champion there, he's very enthusiastic for it. And what I want to show you now is, uh, Brighton is his name, is a little bit of Brighton's experience, okay? I, I did an interview with Brighton and I want to show you briefly what he was saying in terms of OER use uh, and inquiry-based learning there. to show you uh, uh, the use of OER because they were going, we said, here we are going beyond uh, talk and talk. Yeah, we are going beyond, beyond talk and talk. This is interesting. But I want to contrast it with something else. So just, just to go back, have a look at this photograph on the left. So this is the talk and chalk that I'm talking about, yes? 
Aisha Project School in the outskirts of Lusaka in Zambia. Okay? Now, let's take a look at another scenario. This is what I mean by open education resources, opening up. We can look into practices. That's good. I'm going to show you very briefly now, very briefly, um, a video from Stanford University um, of a lecturer uh, who is teaching Java programming um, in a very expensive university with a huge lecture hall. Let's see how he teaches, okay? I invite you to have a look at it. This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. Alrighty, welcome back to CS 106A. Uh, if you're stuck in the back, just come on down, have a seat. Originally, I thought maybe we'd have slightly fewer people today than last time, but that appears not to be the case. So while we're waiting, Everyone loves the baby. So I decided to put a picture of like Carol the Robot, the early days. Um, now, this is actually uh, my son. Um, and yeah, I know. He's got to be a little bit older now, but like, he's got these little robot pajamas that he runs around all the time. So I'm like, oh, it's Carol the Robot. And my wife looks at me like, it's your son. Um, but that's a whole different issue. Anyway, do you administrative announcements before we start? Uh, a couple things, there are four more handouts today, just because we like consistency, about four last time and there's four this time. They're on the back, if you didn't already pick them up, you can pick them up after class. But they have all the information about downloading Eclipse, which is the environment that you're going to use for programming in this class, both for Carol and for Java. Oops, what do they do here? There's also a special handout in there just on using Carol. So it talks about how Carol works in the Eclipse environment, and so you can get all set up with that. And so after today, you'll know how Carol works and you'll have the environment to use it. So surprisingly enough, you all to get your first assignment today. What do we see there? Parts. The first part is so the board talking show, and, and that's how he goes on and on and on and on and on. And on. Next week, October 5th. Something else. There's also an email part. So the email part. New methods in Carol, like the run Asking method, actually is things. the place where Carol will always start. So we can create new methods, and we have to have first Carol program. You need to reload your world, and then you can start it again from that point. Okay. So any questions about our first Carol program? Uh huh. Yeah, he's moving basically from one grade point to the next grade point. So he just moves one step at a time. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is the stuff for you see. It's interesting, isn't it? I'm sorry. I know, I, I did watch it all. I was trying to learn something about programming. It was interesting. So this is what I'm saying. Uh, there is no right or wrong way of teaching. I'm not here criticizing his practice. I'm just showing that we can find all sorts of things in all sorts of places. Yeah? And it's just a matter of having reflexive practice. Is it working what I'm doing? How can, it, how can I tap into technology when I need to? I'm sure he's going to use uh, his slides to show the Java program when he needs to. But if he's thinking that talk and talk is effective and using a behaviorist approach of reinforcement, of yeah? <laughs> throwing sweets and candies over any student that asks questions, if it's working, it's working. People are paying an awful lot of money for that. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. so, yes, so I, I just, uh, so this is the sort of things that open educational resources. and. Beyond that, our practice of opening up what we do to the world allows us to see what other people do, ma makes us think, how do I teach? Yeah? How do others teach? How much time do I have? How much time? Five minutes? Okay.
Okay, I'm going to brush a little bit more now because um, I just want to show you um, repurposing, reuse. We're talking about reuse. This is an experience we had at the Open University uh, asking learners to reuse content. Okay, this is a unit teaching them how to reuse content a master's, at a master's degree level. And when we talk to them about it, this is the sort of things that they said about the experience of reusing. <laughs> yeah, we do not have uh, um, normally the habit of taking someone else's work and changing it. Yeah, we don't, we don't feel, it doesn't feel nice to think of someone changing your work. But actually, I've, I've been enjoying it now. Whenever someone takes my work and change, and they email me back to say, look what I've done to your work. I thought, oh, that's great. Thank you for letting me know, you know, at least. But this is, this is problematic because um, um, people think they're going to damage <laughs> something that the institution has, has done with so much quality. Then how, how? How can we do, how can we improve something that has already been done and has been released with the institutional stamp of quality? So, mindset. Then, response for learner B and learner C again. Is it really a matter of younger generation? I don't know, you should think about it. How comfortable would you be with someone remixing your content? And how comfortable would you be in remixing someone else's content and then showing to your colleague, look what I did to your paper? Hey. Yeah? Again, a matter of attitude, acculturation. It's going to take some time, perhaps, for us to, to feel more comfortable with it. Um, it's just a different type of academic practice altogether. Okay, something else from the Paris Declaration. Encourage the development and adaptation of OER in a variety of languages. I think this is very applicable to the African scenario. Yeah? Again, quick example. This is a, a, a space at the Open Learning Initiative in which people are invited to go in there, download content, remix, reuse it, change it, and put it back into the platform. Okay? So that's why it's called a lab, a laboratory, a lab space. So, here's an example of a university in Brazil which actually said, okay, I'm going to embrace this opportunity and I'll be a collaborator of the Open University. And what am I going to do? I'm going to search for content available from the Open University that I think could be useful to my students over here, universal content, computing for the computers, computing sciences, etc. I'm going to take this content, translate it into Portuguese, so there's some effort and energy inserted in there and make it available to my students so that they can see how people in the other side of the world learn about this content. Interesting perspective, isn't it? But they said there is more to it. We want to do something else. We want to show to the world what else we have to offer because we can also produce good things. So we are going to choose our best courses, translate it into English and put it back into their platform. And that's what they did. So, OER allows us to do that. Exchange co um, content uh, um, cross-border. So, here are the courses they have translated. So, from OER user, they became an OER providers. This is the cycle here. Provision and use in a cyclical way. And then I ask you, is this cultural imperialism? Because this is, this is usually the fear, né? the talk we have about OER. Oh, it's content pushed from, developed, from the developed world into us. Is it really? Or is it a matter of us being proactive and doing something with it? As such, the example I gave you. I personally don't think it's cultural imperialism. I think it's knowledge sharing. And they went further. Here's a business model for you, Frank. They went further. You know what they did in the following years? They, they thought, OK, let's take this content now. We will keep the content available for free, totally for free. But we want to experiment with winter courses. When our students go away, 
Uh, we want to involve them in keeping studying during the winter holidays and involving their families in studying with them at home. So, uh, because they are at home, they can involve their parents, their brothers and sisters. We want everybody studying. And you want to offer some tuition, so we are going to charge a symbolic fee. 60 reais is something like 30 dollars or less, I think. And they can study as many OER courses as they want, because we didn't spend much money producing these courses. We saved money in the production, so we can charge less. We can uh, make a tutor available and we can provide certification. And they could study as many courses as they wanted, the whole family, for one single fee. The whole family is studying using the courses, the, the same courses that I showed you there. Two different models, one with no tuition, no certification, totally available for free, and this one with a symbolic fee involving the whole community with this idea of encouraging students to bring their parents and brothers and sisters and everyone else. Okay? Again, is it cultural imperialism or creativity? New practices. Okay, and just to finish, I hope I'm within my five minutes. I think the word of order for OER really is collaboration. I think that together we can do an, an awful lot, a number of different things. We have already been doing, as I said in the beginning, we have recurrent research questions, they'll keep there, they'll stay there with us, there is a lot to do, but together we can find new answers, we can find new evidence, and we can find new models to push forward this movement that uh, we all hope will really change education internationally. Thank you for your attention.